this needs to be said right off the bat. I am a fan. I am a fan of this series. I've made fan trailers to it. I've written about it. I just, I love this series since the beginning. And now I'm making this video series. And this video is about this. Let's get into it. The story of volume four was an ambitious one. It tried to tell six stories throughout the entire 12 episode volume. Those stories were Teen Ranger and their journey of Mistral, Weiss in her home life, Blake and Son visiting Blake's home, Yang living at home, Cinder at Salem's lair, and Oscar and his internal dilemma. Weiss and Yang's were personal stories with minor overall plot relevance. Weiss more so than Yang because of the occasional discussion between Ironwood and her father that we get to overhear. Blake's is also a personal story, but had plot relevance thanks to the White Fang. Rangers had the most relevance to the overall plot thanks to a discussion between Crow and Raven, Tyrion coming after Ruby, and a discussion scene between Ranger and Crow. Although, it devolved into a story about Ren and Nora in the end. I'm going to discuss each in this order. Weiss, Yang, Blake, Ranger, and finally Cinder and Oscar. I'm only going to discuss scenes or events that are important to me and are scenes I feel I should talk about. The story for Weiss to me is one of the best constructed and emotionally satisfying of the main four. We get introduced to her isolated life at home and how her father treats her as someone to obey and fall in line with his beliefs and decisions in order to best represent the family and company rather than as his daughter. Her mom is also an absentee parent and is only brought up once. We see how this and the society she has to be a part of frustrates her and she wants out of it. It goes to the point that Weiss full on asks, or rather demands, to leave and pursue her ambitions and is immediately slapped with the reality that she is not in control of her own life. But thankfully this doesn't keep her down and thus begins self training, which bears fruit and then runs away from home to Mistral thanks to Best Butler Klein. The scene I want to talk about is Weiss and her rant at the charity event. Why? Because I saw and heard people applauding Weiss for doing what she did, saying that it was great to watch her stand up to this society and her father. <laughs> I can't help but chuckle at that statement. Weiss hurt herself more than anyone else in that room. Why is that? Well, Weiss basically had a temper tantrum. She let her frustrations and anger get the best of her. Instead of showing how awful the woman who pushed her over the edge is, she uses that woman as a jumping point to insult everyone else in the room and demean the problems that each are dealing with. A group that General Ironwood is a part of. This ends with Weiss accidentally activating her semblance, summoning a creature that immediately goes after the person who caused her emotions to explode. I don't blame Weiss for doing and acting the way she did, but I'm not going to congratulate her for it either. If you still believe that what Weiss did is great as a way of standing up to her father and his society, then you don't know what standing up to an oppressive, controlling, rich father figure looks like. Yang's story is disappointing for me in a couple of ways. We don't really spend that much time to explore Yang's feelings about what happened. Its focus is more on what Yang is currently dealing with. One, whether or not she'll put on the prosthetic arm that was made for her. And two, her internal struggle, which is some form of PTSD. Both of these aspects of her story are examined, but just don't feel like they reached a deserved end. PTSD isn't something overcome overnight, but the show treats it as such with only one scene dealing with both issues. The point about the prosthetic arm is good, but the decision for putting it on seems like it was done out of obligation or guilt rather than careful consideration. There is also how Yane's story doesn't explore things that I was looking forward to. One being Yane's feelings about Blake, two, the state of Vale, three, Ty. Blake isn't brought up once in Yane's story, except in the picture that Ty decides to look at during the last episode of the volume. 
We can tell that Yang's statement about not caring about why Blake ran off doesn't carry weight in it due to how Yang turns away from Ruby when saying that at the end of Volume 3. So it sucks to not see Yang's emotions about being abandoned by her best friend who she lost an arm for. The state of Veil vale is brought up, but I was hoping to see Taiya and Yang physically being there helping out for part of an episode, having it be a moment to catch up, discuss, and explore aspects of Yang's story more after the scene with Oblek and Port. Hell, Yang could have brought Tai to go and talk to Junior and his crew about what happened in Vale. For Tai, it's two things. His horrible comment to his daughter, which I'll get to, and that he didn't go with Yang to Mistral. I was looking forward to Tai getting involved with the plot of the show after it is made apparent that Tai wants to go after and find Ruby. It could have been cool but it seems that he won't play any significant role in the plot for a while. Now, to talk about this. That's not the issue, Pete. And besides, she's still a teenager. She is also in the room and can be directly spoken to. And I think I've been through enough to be considered an adult at this point. Adult or not, you still got a long way to go before you're ready for the real world. Oh my gosh, does every father figure just have the same three condescending phrases? Yeah, but we only use them when we mean it. Is that so? As a matter of fact, it is so. If you honestly think that you're ready to go out there on your own, <laughs> well, I guess you lost some brain cells along with that arm. <sighs> You jerk! <laughs> Are we finally talking about the Goliath in the room? <laughs> the discussion after this statement was great. It delves into what is normal and how to handle one's fear, bringing the mood back up. But it didn't fully take away the sting of the comment. One. It isn't funny. Yang, why are you laughing? Two, Yang is shocked along with the professors, but then she is okay with it? There needed to be contrast between the professors and Yang's reactions. What would have made this better is Yang giving a not caring face that says something like, Oh really? With a follow up with her actually saying, with a little chuckle, that may be. This would go far better in showing that she is not only accustomed to it, but okay with joking about the loss of her arm. There are other story beats that I did enjoy, the discussion about how Yang fights being one of them. It totally reigns true when you think about it. Yang is a direct fighter. She can outmaneuver and punish people of similar skill and strength. But when she fights people who are stronger and more agile, she loses. It'll be interesting how Yang adapts from this point on. Blake's story is one that always put a smile on my face after the battle with the Sea Dragon Grim. Sun is a lovable goof this volume and Blake is adorable when being with her parents. It's just a fun time to watch Sun and Blake interact with Blake's parents. What I immediately have to talk about for Blake's story is how Sun is reintroduced to the volume. Putting Sun into a plain black cloak was a horrible idea. Here's why. Reason 1. Viewer Reactions After Episode 3, people started calling Sun an abusive stalker. I don't blame them for the stalker part, since the show treats Sun wearing the cloak as creepy. Abusive is a bit of a stretch though. This is just an after the fact reason, meaning that the crewby didn't consider how fans would react to this character following Blake in this way. Reason 2 it is a detriment to Sun's character. Sun's character that is established through the first three volumes goes like this. He is outgoing, honest. She's still being all, you know, Blakey. A little caring, optimistic. They're probably fine, right? Probably. And kind of a dork. He has a bit of a mouth because he doesn't fully filter himself, but that just comes from his honest nature. Although, when he gets called out on it, he retracts or backs off from his statement. I, uh, well, you see, sir, it's just that, you know, she's such a good fighter and all. Uh, and uh, as a fellow fighter, I have a lot of respect. Why is he here again? Fight, but also for her. Uh, but because he for fighting, just kind of followed me home. She's not good looking. She I see. Very, or slightly? She's definitely above average. 
I mean, uh... He acts as kind of a free spirit, doing just about whatever he wants or feels like doing despite minor consequences. So why is he wearing something that just comes off as creepy? The music while he is wearing the cloak doesn't help either, enforcing the creepy dark atmosphere around Sun, making the viewer believe that the person wearing the cloak is potentially dangerous. But we already know that it is Sun thanks to the opening showing Sun being with Blake. Hell, it doesn't even fit Sun's style of clothing. Reason 3. Why hide Sun? Seriously, if the opening is going to show that Sun is going to be with Blake for Blake's story, why hide him? Why needlessly build suspense or tension for no reason? It's like, ooh, look at this creepy dude stalking Blake. He might do something to potentially harm her. Just kidding, it's just Sun! Yeah, nice try catching us off guard when you already spoiled that Sun was going to be there with the opening. You got us good there. There was a discussion between Blake and the ship captain to start Blake's story. It would be pretty good if the captain caught Sun on the ship and had a similar conversation with him delving into Sun's feelings about Blake. Reason number four. It doesn't mean anything for Sun to wear it. While thinking about other characters wearing similar clothing from other stories, my mind immediately went to Kingdom Hearts 2 where the black coat is worn mainly by Organization 13 members. It has similarity to Sun wearing the black cloak due to protagonist King Mickey and Riku wearing the black coat as well. But playing each of the games and watching the back cover film from Kingdom Hearts 2.8 has made me realize that there is a deeper meaning in the use of the black coat. When the outfit is worn, it hides the face of the person wearing it. This means that we do not understand this person, their motives, their intentions, and their reasons. It makes us distrust the person wearing it, even to a small degree for the people who have yet to be determined as villains. The coat even has stages to it in Kingdom Hearts 2 for both the villains and the heroes. For the villains, it has two stages. Stage 1. Fully on, hood up, face concealed. Again. This means that we don't understand what this person is about and up to. Stage 2. Hood is off. When the face is revealed, it is usually in conjunction with a clear understanding about what this person is trying to do and potentially why. For the heroes, we have a third stage added to the outfit. Stage 3. The outfit is abandoned. When this happens, we have now fully understood the person's goals and reasoning, and thus this person no longer needs to wear it. They are now fully open to us. Mickey is wearing the black coat in order to lay low. We don't know what he is trying to do, but since we can tell it is him, we can trust him. By the midpoint of the game, he takes the hood off and explains that he is trying to find Anson the Wise to see if he has any information on Organization 13. He abandons the outfit a little later when he sees Goofy take a hit and this causes Mickey to decide to fully reveal himself and join the fight against the invading Heartless in Organization 13. We actually first see Riku during the introductory of Kingdom Hearts 2, but we can't actually tell that it is him. It is only by the halfway point of the game that Riku makes another move and Sora only bases that it must have been him on a gut feeling. We're left wondering what Riku is doing and why he is wearing Organization 13's clothing. He has sided with and been used by villains of the series before. It isn't until the end of the game that Riku removes the hood and reveals that he embraced the darkness inside him in order to capture Roxas, and this caused his body to change, and he couldn't bring himself to face his friends. So, he stuck to the shadows and helped out while keeping his identity secret. Even Mickey was asked to promise not to say anything about him. He abandons the black coat after Anson the Wise's machine explodes and causes Riku's transformation to reverse. He no longer has any need for the outfit. There are new characters introduced in the Kingdom Hearts back cover film who also wear the black coat, but it won't be until potentially Kingdom Hearts 3 that we understand what they are about, what they have done, what happened to them, and what they are going to do if they are still around for Kingdom Hearts 3. There's an air of mystery around them that has caused me to be a little suspicious. But why? You'll see. With that, you should now understand why I say the black cloak doesn't mean anything to Sun. It only serves as a reason for Blake to be on edge and is immediately abandoned when actual trouble arrives. It leaves me to ask the question, why, after 6-8 months after Volume 3, is Blake so on edge? 
If someone was coming after her, they would have done something before she got on the boat. Here's the thing. There was a better option to this, and it was staring the Kruby in the face, and they used it consistently in the show that came out and finished before this volume had even started. The Mustache from Ruby Chibi. If you're going to have Sun beat a comic relief for the volume, you should introduce him that way. Give him a somewhat silly detective's outfit a la Sherlock Holmes that hides his hair, tail, and abs, and also includes the fake mustache. This is not only a reference to Ruby Chibi, but also a callback to when Sun and Neptune were given the Junior Detective badges in Volume 2. How awesome would it be if Sun still had that badge? The only other thing that bothers me about Blake's story is how the information gained about the White Fang that leads to Blake's decision to reclaim the organization doesn't make sense. It is revealed that Adam is planning to take over the White Fang. But wasn't he going to be setting up a meeting with Salem's subordinate Hazel? This just immediately causes me to ask, where is the White Fang even located? Why does Ilya have that information? Why did she spy on them in the first place? Who did Sun see wearing the mask? What about the meeting that was mentioned in the first episode? I thought the White Fang was fully corrupt because the two guys who represent him and Ilya are aware of Adam, what he is doing, and are on board with it. Seriously, every example of a White Fang member that is shown is allied with Adam, meaning that the White Fang is just as corrupt as Adam and his forces. We aren't given an example of a good current White Fang member. Why should I believe that the White Fang needs to be taken over by Adam? Did I forget anything? Oh yeah! Blake's dad was the previous leader of the White Fang and is now the chieftain of Menagerie. This may explain why Ozpin easily realized that Blake is a Faunus, but how did no one else make the family name connection? Blake is the opposite princess to Weiss. I can't wait for Sun to tell everyone else in Volume 5. The story of Ranger has a lot going on that sets up future volumes. As Ranger goes on their journey, they find destroyed or abandoned villages that set the final boss of the volume. There is a discussion between Crow and Raven. Tyrion came after Ruby and injured Crow. Crow explained things to Ranger. We got Ren's backstory and how he met Nora fought the final boss, and they finally reached their destination. But, like with Yanes, it doesn't fully explore some of the things it introduces. My issue with the story of Ranger is how it barely attempts to delve into the thoughts and emotions about what happened in Volume 3. I have no idea how Ren and Nora feel about what happened or even if they were affected by it. There is a scene at the end of episode 2 that is beautiful and sets me with the expectation that Ruby will confront Jean about Pira. That never happens. The closest we get to it is near the end of the volume, but it is emotionally charged by current events with only a mention of the previous volume. This is even the only time that Penny was brought up for the whole volume. ReZero had an entire episode dedicated to exploring the trials and emotions on its main character, and it was Oh, so satisfying. I do need to talk about the scene where Ruby's emotions come out before the Knuckle V. Grimm makes its appearance. The thing about Ruby that has been consistent with each volume is her reckless behavior. Ruby doesn't fully think things through. She sees a problem and immediately tries to handle it. An enemy Grimm appears. She charges it and finds herself in over her head. She follows White Fane members without alerting her team and gets captured. She sees Ironwood fail to make it to a ship and decides to go there even though she really can't do anything there. Learns that Pira and Jean are missing, heads out to find them, learns where Pira is, says she has a plan, and doesn't act on that plan. Whatever it was. Weiss had to step up and get Ruby up there. Ruby is told about Cinder and her crew hailing from Mistral. So, she decides to head out without a grasp on how long this journey would take and is not prepared for the potential consequences of this journey while bringing Jean, Ren, and Nora along. Ruby is someone who cannot handle things on her own. Every time she is in a situation by herself, she fails. I am grateful for the backstory of Ren, but it makes me bring up two questions. What about the village that Ren wanted to go to back in Volume 2? You can't tell me that the village was somewhere around Mistral. 
The ship they were in is clearly for short distance travel, which means that the village had to be on the same continent as Vale. Also, they are first year students at Beacon Academy. I seriously doubt they would send their students to another continent just to complete some minor mission that is okay for their ability and grade level. It's almost as if Ren got rewritten after Volume 2, for how relevant that point about him is now. It's not relevant anymore. Why was his father's knife never shown to us before? Ren still has the knife that his father gave him. Where has that been all this time? That is an important piece to his backstory. Again, it's like Ren got rewritten after Volume 2. The scene with Raven and Crow was also very interesting, but Raven is brought up and, once again, the after credit scene of Volume 2 is ignored. That is three times where Raven is brought up or a part of the scene, and the after credit scene is not brought up or even relevant once. We are now three volumes out from that scene. Do something with it. This scene completely ruins the character for me. Why did Crow and Raven leave their clan of bandits for Beacon? Why did Raven start a family with Ty if she is so dedicated to the clan? Why was Raven even at Mountain Glen if she is the leader of the clan now? When Raven was introduced, it seemed like she went rogue and was tracking the movements and actions of the enemy. It gave me the feeling that her methods and actions go against the principles of the group Crow is allied with. But now, Raven is cold, selfish, uncaring, and a survival of the fittest type of person. She is like a weaker version of Esdeath from a comic got kill. Also, Crow drops a bit of a bomb here. If you don't know where the relic is, then we have nothing left to talk about. I don't know where the Spring Maiden is either. You seriously don't know where the Maidens are? Wasn't the group you're a part of created to not just protect mankind, but to help hide and protect the Maidens? How do you not know where they all are? How are you the person that gathers intel? Also, there are relics now. Hey, that's something that has been alluded to before. Kind of. Not really. Questions. How did Tyrion find out that Ruby was heading for Mistral? How come Ranger no longer has the map after a potential misplacement and two map drops? How did Ren get hurt? Why is John just standing there closing his eyes when Ruby is in trouble? Why is John suddenly strong enough to hold back a large grim? Why is Ruby writing with her right hand instead of her left? Why do I have to ask these questions and the ones I already asked prior to all of these? I'm gonna address the John standing there closing his eyes question. I originally talked about this in my Tumblr post, How Did Ren Get Hurt? I was mainly annoyed at the fact that John wasn't doing anything and that the reason for that is so Crow can be the one who saves Ruby. I got an interesting response and made sure to include it in my post. But upon thinking about it further, John standing there and doing nothing about someone else or a friend being in danger is uncharacteristic of him. Whenever he saw that there was trouble or if someone needed help, he was one of the first people to move and try to help out. The group is separated by a Nevermore. One half is pinned. He upon noticing states that they need to get over there and help. Someone who has been bullying him for about a week is being attacked by a Grim. He takes a moment but steps up to defend that person. See smoke in the city and an alarm goes off. He immediately states that they are now to head into the city. Jean originally did this kind of stuff in order to fulfill his goal of becoming a hero like his ancestors. But after Volume 1, it became a part of his character rather than some facade. So hopefully you now understand why Jean standing there closing his eyes when Ruby is in danger is so annoying to me. It is done as a way of saying that he can't do anything and leaves the opportunity for Crow to do it. But it also doesn't fit his character to do so. Jean needed to be running to try and help, but he clearly can't make it. So he closes his eyes as though apologizing to Ruby, but also looking frustrated, as if he is disappointed in himself for not being able to help her, like with Pira. Just a little aside to talk about Ruby writing with her right hand instead of her left. Didn't they make a show bible that covers these sort of things? The thing that says likes, dislikes, character traits, preferred drinks, etc. Is Dominant Hand not one of them? You could argue that Ruby is ambidextrous. 
meaning that Ruby can use her left and right at the same level of expertise. But wouldn't a person like that still use the hand they are most comfortable with? I am right-handed. I play hockey left-handed. I cut meat with my left hand. I cut pasta with my right. I throw right-handed. I bowl with my right hand. If you're ambidextrous, let me know if you use a specific hand for a task or are able to jump to either no matter the situation. I'm really interested. Finally, Ranger is saved by bullshit. Seriously, this is bullshit. This has no setup, no reason for happening. It would have made more sense if Raven and her clan saved them. It is clear that Raven has informants and that they keep track of the movements of the Knuckle V Grim. It's not hard for me to believe that she had people watching the Grimm's lair, and they saw Ruby and Jean carrying a sick crow, so they tell Raven about it. It would be funny when Crow sees that Raven saved him and he responds with, Looks like I spent the one save. That was a weird way of doing the Crow's voice. Then Raven would have Ranger leave and points them in the safest and fastest way to Mistral. This way Ruby meets Raven, but doesn't know who she is. Fucking bullshit. Uh, so this is, this right here, you see me, is me doing this while editing. Uh, because I've been thinking about this for a while after I wrote that. Uh, wrote that bit about the bullshit patrol saving ranger at the end there because it not only is that bullshit but it makes another aspect of the ranger story bullshit rangers uh, rangers crow's semblance is supposed to be bad luck yet the luckiest Thing that could have happened happened and the thing that brings the question is does this do, do semblances run on aura do they use that as fuel to work i don't know because that brings because with that question in mind that whole thing with the wooden beam uh at the end of the Tyrion versus crow fight where it almost hit Ruby and over the head and her aura was out. And and at the same time, Crow's aura was out. So would that mean that his bad luck no longer affected it? Or was that like a lingering effect? Because he hadn't yet, earlier, yet, lost, uh, ran out of aura. But, but then that could, then it's just like this dude's basing his aura or his semblance on just bad coincidences. But they make a song about it. He's apparently had it since birth. And then that brings the question, how does a semblance even manifest? Like the thing with uh, Ren that I didn't think about while writing and editing this, is that it just happens. Why did it just happen? Is it stress? Is it... A change in mind? Like, the kid didn't unlock his aura yet, did he? I thought you had to unlock your aura first in order to have a semblance. That's how it's going with Jean. He unlocked his aura first. And then he's going to get a semblance at some point, which I was expecting to happen for the last episode. But that didn't happen. I just... It's just that it's like you set up these characters with a power. And, the, and, and the, it's such a specific power as bad luck where it causes things bad to happen to just people around him. It doesn't happen to him specifically, I guess. But it happens to things around him. So it's lucky as hell for a patrol ship to have noticed that smoke, or even for it to be out there. It just, it, it it's just, it, it, this ends, this volume ends in such a sour way. Every fight ends in a sour way, which is what I'm going to get into in the next video. And this fight ends with them getting saved by bullshit. 
This shouldn't have happened. I keep looking at my screen that's just below the camera, and I'm hoping my eyeline's actually pretty good translated because I'm looking at myself and not the camera. So, yeah, that was this off-the-cut thing where it's like this, this thing with the patrol ship saving them is not only bullshit, but it makes aspects of the story also bullshit and not properly explained enough. Uh, enough. For us to understand it or, or buy it. Now to get into the side stories. Cinder and Oscar are the side stories for the volume. I am perfectly fine with how Oscar's story played out, but I cannot say the same for Cinder's. Her story and the way it is presented past the halfway mark is very annoying for me. When Tyrion comes back and starts going nuts on a grim, she is showing a concerned face. Almost as if she is not sure anymore about what she is doing. Seriously? You succeeded in taking a maiden's power. Tricked Pyrrha into killing Penny. Killed Ozpin and Pyrrha. And severely weakened the kingdom and its academy. Now you are showing signs of doubt and concern? To top it all off, her story ends with her having to prove to Salem that she can finish Ruby when the time comes. There is no connection between the two of them. Ruby and Cinder barely had contact with one another. Why does Cinder need to prove that she can finish off Ruby to Salem? I can't help but feel that her story ended up as a waste of time. We don't need to see Cinder training or being healed. I would have liked it if Cinder's story ended with the scene of Salem asking her if she did kill Ospin, and come back to her later as she is finishing her training, wiping out a room of Grimm and giving her devilish smirk again. That way, we could have more time dedicated to flashing out aspects of the other stories that I mentioned previously. I got another couple of questions. How did Tyrion get back to Salem's lair so fast? How does Emerald know what Ruby looks like? Why does Salem now want to see Ruby dead when at the first episode she wanted Ruby brought to her alive? Volume 4 seemed to be a volume about recovery. Two of the main four had something to recover from. Blake watching a friend getting hurt and had to relearn to open herself up and continue to be close with those dear to her. Yane had to make a choice that would be decisive for how her life goes from here on out. She had to get back into the swing of things before she went back out into the world. I wish Ruby and the other characters went through a recovery arc of their own this volume, but their stories were more focused on setup. I feel as though this volume cannot stand on its own. It's dependent on the emotions of the previous volume and what will come up in volume 5. When I hear people say that nothing happened, that's what I think the reason for this is. This volume is more set up than anything else. Things that are set up. This might not be everything. Watts at Mistral, Hazel heading for the White Fane, Atlas and its friction with other kingdoms, Adam taking over the White Fane, Raven and a clan of bandits, Relics, a missing maiden, the new Oz, forces being bolstered at Beacon, Yang arriving at Mistral, Blake and company head for the White Fane in order to reclaim it. Things that happened that are important going forward also might not be everything. Weiss runs away from home after being essentially disowned. Yang puts on a prosthetic arm and chases after Ruby. Ranger makes it to Mistral. Blake reconnects with her family. Ren avenges his family. Renora is now a thing. I do have to admit that the volume was structured very nicely. The transitions between stories worked, but I do have to say that having episode 5 only contain Blake's story was a misstep for the volume. It was the shortest episode of the entire volume when it didn't need to be. Again, we could have had this episode longer and explore aspects of characters in more depth. This episode could have had Ruby confront Jean about Pyrrha before they left the village. Jean would have mentioned the people he heard Oz tell them to find back then. And at this moment, Ruby learns that her Uncle Crow is also involved. Thus, they learn of a clue that can get them some of the answers they are looking for. We get an emotional understanding of the characters, and they discover a way to get answers for the questions they have about that night. I ultimately think that they needed more episodes for this volume, especially if they're going to tell this many stories. There was so much that needed to be introduced this volume, they had to depend on the world of Remnant to get us up to speed. 
we got seven World of Remnants. Two happened before and after only one episode. The episode that came after was the shortest episode. They even introduced aspects of Volume 4's story before the show proper could. The moment when we learn in the show that Jock Schnee is not actually a Schnee is ruined by the fact that the World of Remnant about the Schnee Dust Company mentions it first. They are supposed to be expanding the ideas and concepts presented in previous episodes and give the team more time to make the show. They shouldn't be giving us information on these things before they are introduced in the show proper. They can't depend on external material to tell key aspects of their story. Base Game Destiny did this and the story suffered for it. If I had to say which stories happened in what order it would be this. Weiss, Blake, Yane, and Ranger. Blake and Yane's probably happened around the same time so theirs is interchangeable. If I was to change the story structure it would go like this. Start the season with Weiss at home overhearing Ironwood and her dad. In the second episode have a transition to Yane's story with her dad. And Weiss's story on the third when she runs away from home and transition to Blake heading home. Also, for the same episode, have Yane put the prosthetic arm on. During these episodes, we can have cuts to Cinder's story. Next episode, have Yane go to Vale with her dad and Zwei and talk to Team Coffee, where she tells them that Ruby had run off to Mistral, and we look away to see someone's feet who was listening in. Hey, Tyrion now has a reason why he knew Ruby went to Mistral. This visit to Vale could coincide with Blake reaching Menagerie. The next episode ends with Yane's story on the question of who she is going to go after, her mom or Ruby. Thus we transition into Ranger's story. Also, with this transition we also move away from Cinder's and start Oscar's since his takes place in Mistral as well. The episode when Blake learns about what the White Fane is doing and ends Blake's story coincides with Ruby confronting Jean about Pira. It could happen before Blake's story ends. The episode would end with Tyrion meeting the Barley like how the show does. Next episode is the fight. Next is the discussion between Crow and Ranger, and at the same time Oscar is having an argument with Ozpin. The episode ends with Oscar heading out. The final episodes deal with the rest of Rangers and Ren's stories. If I wanted to keep the patrol saving them, show Weiss arriving at Mistral to start the last episode before the battle begins. She sees the patrol ship heading out and asks a soldier about it. Here she then explains the state of the kingdom and why they have constant patrols. Ranger makes it to Mistral and Ruby writes her final letter home with her left hand and explains her final thoughts on everything. Afterwards, Tyrion makes it back to Salem's lair as Cinder finishes her training with a smile. The episode ends with Oscar meeting Crow in the bar asking for the cane. The after credits scene is Watts meeting the headmaster of Haven. <sighs> the time in which things happen now makes more sense, at least to me. I probably have a slew of problems with what I just said. The only reason I'm able to come up with this is because I know how the story plays out. How do you think the story should have been structured? I said what would work better for me, how would it be for you? What aspects of the story bothered you? What parts did you like? What did you think about what I had to say? What do you have to add? What do you disagree with and why? You can answer these in the comments below or message me your responses on Tumblr. The story for Weiss, to me, is one of the best constructed... <laughs> Let's restart that. Because I saw and heard people applauding Weiss for what she did, saying that it was a great... It was... Because I saw and heard people applauding Weiss doing... for doing what she did. I did it wrong again. Saying that it was great to watch and stand up. Oh my fuck! Saying that it was great to watch her stand up to this society. Fuck! We don't really spend that much time to explore Yane's feelings about what happened. I'm gonna redo that one. We don't really spend that much time to displore. To displore. What would have made this better is Yang not getting, I almost, I keep saying not before the giving. Abuse is, a, this is just an, an act of, after, mm -hmm. he acts as kind of a free spirit. But we already know that it is son thanks to the opening showing Blake, showing Blake, showing Blake. It's like, 
Ooh, look at this creepy dude stalking Blake. He might do something to potentially harm... Mm. I'm going to have to redo that one. It's like, ooh. Oh. <laughs> it makes us distrust the person wearing it, even to a small degree for the people who have yet to be determined as vigilants. Vis 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 he has sided with and been used by the... By the Here's the thing. There was a better option to this, and it was staring the Gruby in the face, and they used it cons... cons Here's the thing. Damn it. Give him a somewhat silly detective's outfit, a la Sherlock Holmes, that hides his hair. Oh my god, my voice cr fell apart at that moment. <clears throat> How awesome would it be if stu is stun... Seriously. Every example of a white fame member that is shown is I like... <sighs> Man, I'm about to lose my voice. Uh... <clears throat> I do need to talk about the scene where Ruby's emotions came out before the knuckle the knuck I do need to talk about the scene where Ruby's emotions came came. Uh -huh. I do need to talk about the scene where Ruby's emotions come out before the knuckle of E Grim Fabian, that was a horrible pause. I do need to talk about the scene where Ruby's emotions come out before the knuckle V Grim Stop saying Knuckle V and then pause and then Grim Fabian. And is not prepared for the potential consequences of this journey while blinging. While blinging. And is not prepared for the. Emo <sighs> the scene with Cra Craven. Yeah! Combine both of their names, Fabian, and call him Craven. <laughs> Why did Crow and Raven leave their clan of bandits for, be for Beacon? I almost called it Bacon. <laughs> <sighs> I'm not okay. <laughs> but it also doesn't feel... feel. Just a little aside to talk about Ruby writing with her right, right hand. The thing that says, like, that says... The thing that says likes, dislikes, character traits... Character traits. Meaning that Ruby can use her left and right hand at the same level of, of expertise... Meaning that Ruby can use her left and right. But when a per person, let me know if you use a specific hand for a task. Or, or our, why does Salem now want to see Ruben, Ruben? She had to get back into the swing of things before she went back, she went back out into the world. I'm going to re-say that one. <sighs> I feel as though, <sighs> I'm going to get some water. All right, back to this. Uh, uh. There was so much that needed to be introduced this volume that they had to depend on the world of remnants. Ah, fuck it. I, that was too long of a pause. They are supposed to be expanding the. There's. Man, I had an easier time reading this before recording. But I was in a much better state of being. It could happen before Blake's stories. What is wrong with me? If I wanted to keep the patrol saying, I'm going to say, I said saying since I wanted to stop that. He or she then explains that. What is fucking wrong with me? <sighs> 